Hello, Ron Clark here with another edition of Musings and a session with our magic box. Let's see what we have today. Oh boy. Okay, so we have several questions all at once. Okay. So, looks like we have three or four questions here. Okay, so first question. What is the importance of the personal God to initiation and magical life in general? For those of us who have decided to unlearn the gods of organized religion, how can we find our personal God? Okay, this primarily relates to step 9 and 10 of initiation Germanics. And to begin with, One's concept and experience of the cosmos is much different when you have completed all of the previous eight steps of initiation to hermetics and are working on step nine and then step ten. So, with that in mind, now, the reason Barden stresses the four fundamental qualities is because those are the qualities that describe the cosmos. To truly conceptualize the entire infinite cosmos, they must, it must possess these four qualities. Let's put it that way. Now, we have to go way back into the beginning of initiation to hermetics and the four elements. Okay? So, the hermetic, shall we say, um, understanding of the cosmos is that it's composed of these four elements, which are also the four fundamental qualities. They each correspond to one of the elements. So, Throughout initiation, you've gotten these four principles that make up the cosmos, that are also the components of the name of God, yod heh vav -He, right? This is the unspeakable name of God, and in Bardonian Hermetics, we're working with that same unspeakable name of God. And the only way to utter the unspeakable name is by becoming those four universal qualities, by becoming the four elements. And that's what the training basically has rendered. You are a being at that point of the four elements, of the four fundamental qualities. In other words, you are an image of the cosmos. So what we are doing with the personal God is we are first externalizing that relationship between self and cosmos. And we're postulating an image, an anthropomorphized image, if you want, of that cosmos that we can relate to on a personal level. Okay, that's the first stage. Now, that image, that God, is totally up to you to create. That's what step 9 and step 10, the astral exercises, are all about. Okay? Is you're creating this personalized, relatable uh, image of the cosmos, of deity, of God, whatever you want to call it, 
And that image reflects the four elements, the yod he vav he. So this is the ultimate deity, if you will. The ultimate representation of the cosmos to your intellect and to your feeling. Because it's just an astral exercise. It must be embellished with passion. You know, that it must be a passionate relationship with one's own deity. Okay, so the reason we do this, the reason we build this personal relationship, is because what we are going to do is we are going to become that deity. Okay? With the aim of becoming that deity and acting as that deity. So our will becomes deific, if you will. You know, it has that same power that we have invested in our image of deity, that we have developed this personal relationship with. And through that personal relationship, we merge our awareness with the infinite. You see, the only way to truly comprehend an infinity of anything is to become that infinity. We can't truly understand it in the normal way, little bit by little bit, because it's infinite. It will take literally forever to come to an understanding of an infinity by little sequential bits. We must become the infinity to truly comprehend it. And we do that, in this case, by first establishing this personal relationship that is totally intimate and passionate. And then through that, that acts as a doorway for us to merge with that deity and become the deity. And we can do this with all kinds of deities, but the main thrust of this exercise is that you connect with the yod he vav he is a perfect example of that infinite deity that encompasses everything. Okay? Okay. Question number two. Do earthbound beings, other than humans, feel a desire for spiritual development and to experience the unity? If so, do they have access to practical means to expedite their development? Well, <clears throat> that's a complicated sort of question to answer. Most other beings that exist, most other things that exist, have a very different path than human, we humans do. Now, we humans have the ability to effectively, at least ideologically and intellectually, remove ourself from participation in the universe. We're still participating in all that, but in our heads, in our hearts, we remove ourselves from that. So, we need spiritual development. This is a very human thing. Okay? And humanoid. Um, beings that have this ability, we're not the only ones, but beings that have that ability to remove ourselves, to step back, disconnect from the cosmos. We very seldom live as conscious participants in the cosmos. So, that's what spiritual development is for, to come back into 
conscious participation with the cosmos. That's the definition of spiritual development. Okay? So, take a blade of grass, for instance. A blade of grass, one single blade in an infinite uh, array of blades of grass that exist throughout the cosmos, that single blade of grass does not need spiritual development because it lives constantly in conscious participation with the cosmos. Most beings, most things that we encounter in our lives other than human beings live in continuous conscious participation with the cosmos. That is their existence. That is, whereas human beings exist to go through this process of self spiritual development and reconnect at a conscious level with the cosmos, other beings exist just to participate in the cosmos, not to develop spiritually because it is not necessary, but simply to exist as part of the cosmos. So, every creature that has this power to separate themselves from conscious participation does have to go through a process equivalent to spiritual development. That's just the way the universe is built. It all aims towards conscious participation in the cosmos. So each of those kinds of beings has, as you say, access to practical means. And the practical means for each thing are different depending on the type of being. Humans, we have a specific means by which we attain this spiritual development. We can regain our conscious participation. Okay? So other beings that have that ability also have the ability naturally to reclaim their full conscious participation with the cosmos. Okay. Question number three. Regarding wish work, why is repeated effort necessary for the attainment of one's objective? What are the variables that determine the realization of one, a mental-related wish, two, an astral-related wish, and three, a material-related wish? The reason it takes repeated effort is because it is a wish. It's not a need. It's a wish, a desire, a want. It's not a need. All of our needs are met very easily by the universe. And if we come across a need that is unfulfilled, it doesn't take repeated, you know, wishing to make it happen because it is a need. And Divining what is a need compared to what is just a wish it takes a certain degree of maturity and experience, that's all. Okay. So when you're working with wishes, wants, desires, as opposed to needs, you will have to do your wishing repeated times. No matter when in your life you do it. Okay, you can be a incredibly advanced magician, but if you come up with a wish or a want, a desire, it's going to take more effort 
than a need to accomplish. Okay? That's just the nature of the beast, because you're not, in that case, working with the cosmos. You're imposing your will on the cosmos to get something you want or wish for or desire, okay? And that takes more effort. Now, the greatest block here is wishing, desiring, wanting something completely impossible to achieve. World peace. I want world peace. Whoopity doo. <laughs> you know, you are not going to be able to achieve world peace. You might be able to achieve a feeling of peacefulness within yourself, but you're not going to be able to achieve world peace. So, you have to really, honestly, evaluate your want or desire. Is it even possibly achievable in the mundane sense? Not by some miracle. Okay? If it is achievable in the mundane sense, like I wish my shoes were tied. Okay, well, I tie my shoes. Okay, it's achievable in a mundane sense. If I wish that my shoes did not require laces to be tied up, well, it's achievable in a mundane sense, but that means I've got to either remake my shoes or go buy another type of shoe, right? So, sensible, reasonable, is it achievable? Is it then achievable in the far long run or is it achievable in the immediate sense? This determines so much. I mean, are you going to have success with your wishing, you know, immediately or in five years? And it may take a lot of effort for those five years to achieve your wish, which usually with wishes and desires and wants, you're far better giving up just wishing for something and make it happen. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. Oh, number four is a long, long-winded one here. In the second video that you made in this Musings playlist, you said that the magician should always be aware of whether they are exercising their power with or over the universe. My question then would be, what are the best ways to know if one is exercising their power with or over the universe? For example, when using the vital energy to heal someone, what would using the vital energy in a power with manner look like versus a power over manner? If one uses their power to boost their intellect, or maybe their charisma, or even just their ability to appeal to others, would this then be power over, or power with? Or does the method that one goes about achieving these things affect what type of magic it is? Does using your power with the universe limit what one can accomplish? Since power over kind of magic is all based on ego and selfish desires, it can seem that someone who does use their power does use their power for their own selfish purposes can get away with having everything they want while neglecting the needs of all the suffering beings on planet Earth. In general, I guess I'm confused on what do you exactly mean by power over versus power with? Okay. So, uh, we're an example of healing with the vital energy. Uh, if I s approach someone who needs healing, 
and I just throw the vital energy at them and say, you will heal. That's power over, okay? If I offer up the vital energy to a person's body and say, here, you can heal with this energy if you want to. That's power with for healing. So, <clears throat> there is a school of healing, a very allopathic school of healing, shall we say, that goes, okay, disease, cure, bam, you know, you have a cure. The disease is knocked out, right? Now, that goes against, really, how the universe works, how disease works, how illness works. What is the point of illness? The point of illness is for us to learn something. And often, what we need to learn is taking responsibility for our own health. Now, the body has the capability to heal itself. All healing is really the body healing itself. That's where true healing comes from, is the body healing itself. So, in healing with power with healing, we provide the body with what it needs to heal itself. We don't heal anything, we are just conduits for the energy which already exists in the universe. We're not creating anything of ourselves. We're taking it from the universe and offering it up to the body to heal on its own and certainly encouraging the body to heal on its own. Okay? That's power with. That is the same in any kind of change we want to affect in the universe. Are we just exercising our will and it's our will or nothing? Or are we giving energy so that things might evolve in the way that they need to evolve? Whether it meets our will or not. You have to step back from the ego desire to affect change. Okay? That is an ego desire. The desire to change everything around us. Make it all conform to this little vision we have of how it should be. That's power over. Okay? When we step back and realize that, A, we're not the brightest bulb in the pack. You know, we don't know what the rest of the universe needs. And our little, you know, way of doing things may, may be totally wrong for the rest of the universe. And we have no idea of that, okay? So step back from that place of needing to control and participate instead. If you want to see a change in the universe, the best way to see that change is to change the self first. Okay, so that the universe changes automatically along the lines of this new creative flow, as opposed to just inserting your will and you know, breaking it all apart so that it follows your desire. Um, yeah, you have to step back a little bit and consider everything else. What it needs versus what you need. And as I've always said, what you need is always met by the universe. But you have to understand what it is you need as opposed to what you want or what you desire 
or what you wish. These are two very distinct, almost always very distinct things. Sometimes your wishes and your desires, you know, correspond perfectly with the universe, but you'll know when that happens. So, it's less about difference in technique than it is in application of the technique. The technique is the same. It's just how you manifest that technique and how you apply the technique. Are you going in like the bull in the china shop and having your way, or are you going in like the cat? and stepping around things and viewing everything and appreciating everything, right? That's what it comes down to. That's really the difference between with and over is all in here, okay? Okay. I think that's it for today. I hope I've answered those questions well enough. So, next week, we'll go at the magic box again. And, uh, yeah. If you have any questions, as usual, please write them in the comments section below and I'll add them to the box. And slowly, we're making our way through. We're making some real headway now. So, till then, bye-bye.